evening, everybody, and welcome to Princeton Public Library's virtual home here on Crowdcast. We are so glad to have you here tonight for an author event. Uh, this is our third night in a row that we've been here on Crowdcast doing programs and events, and I see some people have come back several times in a row, uh, and that's great to have you here with us. So tonight, our uh, book is <clears throat> uh, The Daughters of Yalta. It's um, a book that I had no idea about the topic of it until um, I got an email from the author and I started reading it and it was just so engrossing to find out about the role of the daughters of Churchill, Roosevelt and Harriman and the, and the role that they played in the Yalta Conference. And so to me, this is kind of like one of those untold stories of history that uh, needed to come to the forefront and it was done in such a wonderful way. And so I'm so glad that we have the author here tonight and that she's gonna be joined in conversation with Kate Anderson Brower, who uh, actually spoke for the library almost about a year ago now uh, when her own book came out about the President's Club and the White House, and she did that for our Friends of the Library benefit. So it's wonderful to have uh, both Catherine and Kate here tonight. So Catherine Grace Katz is a historian with degrees in history from Harvard and Cambridge. She is currently pursuing her JD at Harvard Law School, and The Daughters of Yalta is her first book. And she's going to be interviewed by Kate Anderson Brower, who is an American journalist. And she's also written three books about the White House, two of which have been New York Times bestsellers. She has covered the White House for Bloomberg News during Obama's first term. And before that, she was at CBS News and Fox News as a producer. So two very uh, distinguished scholars and historians joining us here. So welcome to uh, Catherine. And welcome to, whoopsie, let me get Kate up here. Okay, welcome, and I'm going to disappear and let you two take it away, and I know that we have lots of people here online excited to learn about this story, so take it away. Thank you so much, Janie. Thank you, um, and thank you, Catherine, for inviting me to uh, have this discussion with you. I'm such a fan of your work, and I think this book is incredible. I've been, I've read it before, and I'm reading it uh, again now to prepare for tonight to come up with some good probing questions. Um, and I was also saying that I lo absolutely love the cover of this book. Um, I don't know if you, were you very involved in selecting the cover image? <laughs> I, I had some input there. Actually, kind of a funny story about the cover, which maybe we should maybe go back to. Remind me before we, okay. we end that I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, okay. But first, Kate, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's such a pleasure to have this chat with you. And so it's, writing this book has one of the greatest pleasures has been getting to know people like you, people that I've admired, whose work I've read for a long time. And so it's just really such a, a personal treat to be able to do this with you. So thank you so much. And thank you to the Princeton Library for having me. Um, I actually spent six months working in Princeton while I was uh, a financial analyst prior to going back to being a historian. So I know and love Princeton. It is such a charming town and uh, hope to get back in person one of these days. And you're coming to us from another very prestigious uh, school. You're in your, your dorm at Harvard, right? I am, in, I am in my dorm. The beauty of Zoom is that you can use a, a virtual background and pretend you're somewhere that you're not. If you hold very still, no one has any idea. It's a virtual background. <laughs> but uh, here I am in my 1960s dorm room, uh, <laughs> made a little bit more uh, attractive with some maps on the wall. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like it. I like it. Well, let's let's dive into the discussion because um, you talk a little bit in the book about how you got involved in it. And I, I, it's such a specific topic. I mean, I think it's a really smart way to talk about World War II and um, bring these these characters to life by looking at them through the eyes of their daughters and to think of these men, Churchill, Harriman and Roosevelt and Stalin, because you do talk about his, his relationship with his daughter, which is pretty uh, different from those other leaders. Yep. <laughs> um, and I just wondered, you know, what got what made you think to do this, to do this book? How did you how did you first come up with the idea? It was a series of fortuitous coincidences. I certainly did not set out to write a book about the Yalta Conference. I hadn't set out to write a book at that moment at all. I had always loved reading and writing and wanted to be a writer since I was a little girl. I was always scribbling stories and found tons of notebooks of old stories that I wrote during the pandemic and a big, <laughs> big cleanup. But I uh, had studied history as an undergrad and grad student. And then like many recent grads went to work in finance in New York and thought history and I were done for a while. And maybe I'd would be able to have a chance to be a writer later in my career. 
But by coincidence, in the lobby of my office in Manhattan was a bookstore called Chartwell Booksellers, named after Churchill's home. And I used to go down and visit the bookstore many times a week when I'd go down to get a coffee, you know, when I'd need a break from the, the Excel modeling, which was uh, a little different from being a, a historian. And after so many visits, I got to know the owner of the bookstore, and he very kindly introduced me to the International Churchill Society, uh, which is made up of scholars and academics and professionals of all walks of life that want to encourage people to study uh, history and go into public service, much like Churchill, uh, and members of the Churchill family are also involved. And around this time, the family was opening the papers of Churchill's daughter, Sarah, to researchers for the first time. And the society asked if I'd be interested in writing an article about her papers for their magazine. And I said, yes, just thinking this would be a fun way to re-engage with history, do a bit of writing. Meanwhile, I was applying to law school and I could not have imagined that it would take me on a whole journey in a very different direction, but one that I was so excited to find myself on. And how long did um, the process take to write, write the book, research and write? It took about three years, about a year and a half of mostly research and a year and a half of mostly writing. Uh, the first two years I was exclusively working on the book and the third year I was also doing my first year of law school. So uh, <laughs> keeping busy. <laughs> can't imagine that. Um, you, something you say towards the end of the book, you talk about Kathy um, and how she simply never believed that she was particularly important. And I mm -hmm. thought that was really interesting. Did you feel like you were telling these women's stories for the first time and as, as, as a, a female historian, did you feel, feel particularly empowered by that? That no one had really thought of the role that these women played in the Alta Conference before. And so I think it's, I think it's a really interesting way to get into this enormous story of post-World War II Europe, you know? But you were really giving voice to these women who didn't think that their voices mattered that much at the time, right? Yeah, I think it was partly uh, that, you know, they weren't uh, power brokers in the way that you typically think of government leaders um, or military leaders, and also a real sense of humility that so many members of that generation had where everyone felt like they were just doing their bit that was no more important than anyone else and just quietly going about the business of winning the war. And that's something that was really uh, very true about so many of the people in the book, both men and women. But what was really exciting was writing this book about the Yalta Conference in part, but more importantly, I think, about the relationships between these fathers and daughters is that we study things like the Yalta Conference, and I certainly had studied Yalta many times in school and had no idea that Churchill, Roosevelt, and Ambassador Avril Harriman had chosen to bring their daughters with them to serve as their aides. But we also have a tendency to put these leaders on a pedestal to the extent that they become more than human, and we really forget that they're also part of a family. And at the end of the day, they're also someone's dad. And what would it be like to be their child and to be with them on the precipice between World War and Cold War? So it, for me, it also really humanized this moment in history and these leaders that we know so much about. And it's easy to divide their public life and their private lives, but really they're inextricably bound together. And that was what was really exciting for me about being able to tell this story, reintroduce three women who were remarkable back into the historical record and also show a, a different side of the leaders than we normally get to see. And, and of those three leaders, who had the best relationship with their, I mean, who was the most solicitous of their daughter's opinion? Um, and who was the one who brought up the idea of bringing their daughter? And how, how did that all come to be? Well, the relationships between the fathers and daughters were each really unique. Churchill and his daughter, Sarah, probably had the most um, loving and familial and typical, I guess, uh, father-daughter relationship, where Churchill was really appreciative and highly respected and valued the opinions of his family, especially his wife and daughters. They were some of his greatest advisors, and he truly relied on them. And that was something that was consistent throughout his entire career. Churchill was the first of the three of them to think about bringing his daughter as an aide, and he first brought Sarah to the Tehran conference in 1943, which was the first time Churchill, FDR, and Stalin all met, and at that conference they were laying the plans for D-Day. Churchill decided to bring his daughter for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, he and his wife Clementine had decided early in the war that when he traveled abroad, someone from the family should go with him as a protector and confidant of sorts in this environment where it's so hard to know who you can trust to be able to have that person you can speak frankly with about your deep concerns. Uh, and Churchill also uh, wanted someone there who understood the military aspects of the war. 
Sarah Churchill was uh, in the women's branch of the Royal Air Force. She was an intelligence officer, so that was something she understood. But she'd also been an actress before the war, and acting and diplomacy really went hand in hand. So she understood the content of the conference and also the the uh, kind of the need to to speak around the point and to keep a, a low profile, but insert yourself at the appropriate time and gather information and bringing it back. Uh, she had a really close bond with her father since she was really young and felt that she understood him. Uh, but she was also a beautiful writer like he was. And that was really important because he wanted to write his wartime memoirs when it was all over. And he needed someone to capture what was happening outside of the official conference minutes. So Sarah is the perfect person to really capture the spirit and almost the conscience of the conference. And her letters are just beautiful. And so for me, the story really started with them. But Kathy Harriman and Avril Harriman and FDR and Anna had also really distinct relationships. Avril Harriman was not a warm and fuzzy father by any means. And he was a, a businessman, one of the richest men in America at the time, had been the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad. And he wasn't very involved in his daughter's lives until they were teenagers after their mother died. And he invited the, his daughters to come and be involved in his business world to whatever extent it interested them. And his daughter, Kathy, jumped at the chance. And they solidified what became a partnership, kind of almost more like business colleagues than father and daughter in a way in the years before the war. And then she had the opportunity to go with him first to London where he was the lend lease on boy and they became very good friends with the Churchills. And then to Moscow where she ended up having more access to and experience with Stalin and his inner circle than any other American woman in history. So it was a very interesting relationship and one where he really respected And she was very bold and daring and adventurous, which were all qualities that were important to the Soviet Union. But it wasn't warm and fuzzy like Churchill and Sarah. And then FDR and Anna, uh, it was, um, a, I think that was the relationship that was almost the hardest to write about sometimes because for them, it began as a very close relationship when uh, Anna was a little girl. But FDR's polio diagnosis really changed it. And they spent many years at much more of a distance. And Anna was always trying to recover that closeness with her father she remembered from the time she was a little girl. And she just was never quite able to receive the love and admiration and attention from her father that she always hoped that she could have. And so it was one where she's striving always to be recognized by him. And sometimes it just doesn't come back the way that she wants it to, which is really interesting when you think especially about FDR and his role of advocating for women uh, in the United States at the time, but the personal relationships within the family are a little bit of a different dynamic. Hmm. And what about the relationships among the women? Because um, I think that like Anna Roosevelt and Kathy Harriman did not click, right? And there was <laughs> tension there yeah. among them. And I thought that was fascinating. Not that I want to talk about, you know, cat fights, but it is interesting that the three of them are kind of vying for their father's attention and for influence yeah. in the conference. So how would you describe those dynamics? I think it's tempting to see you know, the fact that there are going to be three women at this conference and assume that they're going to be the best of friends because mm -hmm. they understand this position in a unique way that really it's a very small club of women that are that are uh, having this kind of wartime experience. It's really just Sarah Churchill and her sisters, her sister-in-law, Pamela Churchill, Kathy and, uh, and Anna. But it's uh, easy to lose sight of the fact that while they are situationally similar, their duties and their loyalties are first and foremost to their fathers and to their countries. And even though Churchill and Roosevelt and the United States and Britain had a really close relationship, of course, a special relationship, at this point in the war, the relationship has frayed a little bit and fractured. And so you can see that reflected in some tensions between Sarah and Anna Roosevelt. But then between Anna and Kathy Harriman, it's also a different dynamic, even though they're both Americans. Kathy Harriman has been in the mix the entire war. She's been in London during the Blitz, where she and her father were very close with the Churchills. They were celebrating Kathy's 24th birthday on December 7th, 1941, when they all learned the news together about Pearl Harbor. Then she goes to Moscow, where she really is serving as Avril's right-hand man and assistant ambassador. Meanwhile, Anna has kind of come to the party a bit later. She'd been out in Seattle with her husband as an editor of a newspaper. And then she'd moved home to the White House at Christmas 1943 when her husband joined the military. And she began to take a much more active role in her father's White House and in many ways becoming his gatekeeper. But she hadn't been in that circle since 1941 like the other daughters. The others really knew everyone across all of the delegations and Anna was kind of an unknown entity in a way. And so you can see Anna feeling like as the president's daughter, she's the ranking daughter. 
Whereas Kathy Harriman is someone that people are already comfortable with and they defer to her just because they're used to having her around, which makes their relationship really interesting. How much How does much Anna's, um, well, I always think about Eleanor Roosevelt and the fact that Anna kind of sided with her father in a way by by hiding his affair or, or, or sort of covering for him a lot. And it, it mm -hmm. seems like she was put in this impossible position. And can you talk about how that impacted her relationship with her father? Absolutely. Yeah, El the, that relationship between FDR and Anna is really complicated. Anna knew from when she was a little girl that her father had had an affair with this woman named Lucy Mercer, who had been Eleanor's social secretary. And Eleanor found out about their affair and threatened to divorce him. He promised he'd never see Lucy again, and the marriage did survive, but in a, a different way than it had been before. So that's where you see that great political alliance between Eleanor and Franklin, but less of the emotional bond that they had previously. And Anna was aware of how much this had hurt her mother. But by Christmas 1943 and by the spring of 1944, Anna realizes that some another dynamic has entered the picture. And this is the fact that her father is dying of congestive heart failure. She had noticed he wasn't well when she moved home. She insisted he be examined by the doctors, which revealed this diagnosis. And Anna sworn to secrecy. She can't tell anyone about this diagnosis. And even FDR doesn't want to know what's wrong with him. But you can imagine as the wartime president, you don't want to a, you know, really embrace that um, your own mortality. And so Anna is desperate to do anything she can to protect her father, to give him any modicum of relaxation and peace that she can in the middle of this war. And one day he approaches her and asks if an old friend of his can come to dinner while Eleanor is out of town. And Anna knows right away that this is Lucy. So Lucy, uh, she, well, Anna's faced with a, a dilemma of whether to betray her mother or to do anything she can to prolong her father's life. And she decides that she has to try to protect her father above all. And she allows Lucy to come to dinner and she keeps this huge secret from Eleanor, which becomes a, a real cloud over their relationship. But Anna justifies it on, you know, this, you know, wanting to look out for his health as much as she can. But also she oddly is able to get from Lucy some of the almost parental warmth and love that she didn't receive from her parents. And it's only through Lucy, who becomes a friend of Anna's, that uh, Lucy is able to express to Anna the love and affection that FDR has for his daughter that he himself doesn't express directly to her, which is really interesting, but also just so awful that she's in this position to have to make these choices. It's an incredible story. Um, what would you say about the actual concrete results of Yalta that had to do with these women being there? What was different because they were there? How did yeah. they change it? Well, Yalta was known, if we think back to AP US history in high school, sometimes you don't even get into that many of the details because it usually comes at the end of the year uh, where the teacher realizes that we're running out of time. So it's kind of, you know, the Yalta conference happened and then the bomb dropped and then the war ended the end. Yes. Um, yes. But the issues put on the table were really four important ones. Others, of course, but four key ones were what to do about Germany in the post-war period, the end of the war in Europe was finally in sight. The race was on to liberate Berlin between East and West. And so the leaders have to decide if Germany is going to be one country or be broken up into smaller states. Also really important at this time is the uh, future of Poland and Polish sovereignty. It's very important to Britain and to Churchill that Poland remain free and independent. That's the reason they went to war in the first place. Churchill can also see the rising power of the Soviet Union, and he doesn't want them to have any more power than they already have. Stalin sees... Uh, threats on his border. He knows it's a weakness, uh, this Western flank, and so he wants to make sure that the Polish government is friendly to the Kremlin. Meanwhile, Roosevelt's more focused on the Pacific. He wants to save as many American lives as possible, doesn't yet know if the atomic bomb will be a success. So in order to save American soldiers, wants to bring the Soviet Union into the war in exchange for territory. And he also wants to get Soviet buy-in into what he sees as his legacy, and that's the founding of the United Nations. He wants to succeed where Woodrow Wilson failed and create a peace organization for all time. And so those are some of the main issues. The daughters are not in the conference negotiations themselves. They don't have the security clearance for that. However, they're with their fathers late at night when they're back thinking through the issues up for debate. Sarah Churchill is in the room with her father till two o'clock in the morning where he's expressing his frustration of how FDR doesn't understand the importance of Poland in the future, uh, that he thinks FDR is very short-sighted. Meanwhile, Kathy Harriman is the only person who really understands this difficult position that her father, the ambassador, is in, where he really agrees with Churchill, but has to represent FDR's interests. 
And Anna, meanwhile, is literally trying to keep her father alive. At every turn, she's warding off people who want to meet with him, trying to block the ones that she feels are unnecessary, uh, to give him any chance to relax and recover as much as she can. And this includes sometimes getting in the way of meetings with Churchill, which FDR doesn't want to have because he's not necessarily seeing eye to eye with Churchill at this point and doesn't want to give Stalin the idea that he and uh, Churchill are ganging up on the Soviets. So he allows Anna to run interference to suit his political ends, uh, which is really interesting. However, you know, we could criticize that and uh, perhaps we should, but if Anna hadn't been doing that, perhaps FDR might have died at Yalta. She's literally keeping him alive every day. And uh, I don't know how he can get much more powerful than that. Yeah, I mean, they're the ultimate gatekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of the chiefs of staff to their, their fathers. Um, yes. And it's funny that they were nicknamed the little three and their fathers were, you know, the big three, but but they they were much more, more powerful and I think people gave them credit for. And nobody talks about this this particular aspect of the story. One thing I wanted to make sure I brought up was Stalin and his daughter mm -hmm. and how difficult that um, relationship was, and how different it was. But I think her name was Svetlana, is that her name? The, yeah. The daughter? Yep, her name is Svetlana, and she's 19 at the time of Yalta, and she did speak English, so she could have been a useful asset and a daughter diplomat, much like the others. But she and Stalin have a very bad relationship at this point because she'd learned as a teenager that her mother had committed suicide and was driven to it by Stalin's cruelty. Svetlana rebels by falling in love with a much older, married uh, Soviet Jewish cinematographer who Stalin then exiles to Siberia. Uh, she then rebels again and falls in love with her classmate, Grigory Morozov, and she marries him at just 19 years old. And he's also Jewish, and Stalin really takes exception to this and refuses to ever meet his son-in-law. So Svetlana is 19, married, pregnant at the time of the conference. But Stalin had allowed Svetlana to meet Churchill when Churchill came to Moscow earlier in the war. And he brought her out at dinner almost like a prop, as if to show Churchill that he was a family man too, which is very odd when you think of Stalin. And so Svetlana comes down, she has a little conversation with Churchill in English, and Churchill says to Svetlana that she reminds him of his own redheaded daughter, Sarah. Both Svetlana and Sarah were redheads. So after this meeting, Svetlana sent a brooch to Sarah as a gesture of daughter-to-daughter -daughter diplomacy, and Sarah wears this brooch on her uniform throughout the conference uh, and this lovely gesture to the daughter who's not there. So Svetlana is you know, very much there in spirit. Oh, I love that detail because it's also a very smart, like shrewd political move to do mm -hmm. that too. Um, Absolutely. Which of the daughters had the best political instincts, do you think? I think that it was Sarah Churchill. She really was so much like her father in spirit and temperament and wanted to make her own way in the world on her own terms. Uh, but at that time, politics wasn't a career that she would have considered to be open to her. And so she decided to go uh, and become an actress, which was one of the few things that she thought she could do as a career. But she really had an astute understanding of domestic and foreign policy. She was an intelligence analyst. So she really understood the details of the war, sometimes even better than her father did. There's a really hilarious story where she'd been working for months on Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. And she comes home for the weekend on leave and goes in to see her father as he's getting ready for dinner. And he says to her, at this moment, go sailing, the Mediterranean, uh, go sailing towards the Mediterranean, 542 ships. And she says, actually, Papa, I believe it's 543. And he says, how do you know that? And she says, well, I've only been working on it for months. And he says, why didn't you tell me? And she says, because there's such a thing as security. And then Churchill <laughs> goes down to dinner that night. And Eleanor, or, uh, yeah, Eleanor Roosevelt is the guest of, uh, of honor. And so he repeats the story to Eleanor, thinks it's hilarious. And he's so proud of Sarah for her, her great work and accomplishment as a WAF. And then Eleanor Roosevelt is so charmed and tells the story to the press. And Sarah then gets hauled in front of her superiors and they're demanding, <laughs> you know, who told this story to Mrs. Roosevelt? Who leaked it to the press? And she could only say, I'm so sorry. It was my father, the prime minister, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. But this kind of this uh, really respectful and jovial relationship between them goes on throughout the war. Uh, after the Yalta Conference and uh, during the summer of 1945, Britain's preparing for a general election. And even though the population really appreciates and loves Churchill, they're also just so desperate for change and something different after so much suffering throughout the war. And Churchill doesn't understand why he's not doing better in the polls. And Sarah, who's been working with a cross section of all different kinds of people from Britain in her job uh, in military intelligence, writes this uh, long about 10 page letter to him analyzing 
the forces that she sees and the sense that people aren't voting against him, but just voting for change and a sense of wanting to continue this spirit of um, supporting each other and not wanting to go back to the stratified social structure of before the war. And it's a really astute piece of political writing, which Churchill then tells her how much he admires and how helpful it is. And so it, it really is remarkable what instincts that she had. And if she'd been born maybe 10 years later, uh, perhaps she could have succeeded her father in politics, which would have made her a contemporary of Margaret Thatcher, which would have been really interesting. Oh, wow, that's so interesting to think about. Um, mm -hmm. I hate to ask this question because I think I know the answer is really depressing. What <laughs> happened to these women after? <laughs> Especially, I mean, I just was shocked at some of these stories about after Yalta and, and what happens in their personal lives. And each of them go through these enormous tragedies. And yeah. it, can you kind of explain some of that and maybe why there's this similar pattern happening to each of these three women? It's bizarre. I mean similar tragedies going on in their lives. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, without going into too much detail in case anybody doesn't want any spoilers, um, the, the three women all do experience similar tragedies, which really comes down to the lack of understanding that we had at the time of PTSD and mental health. And each of them have husbands who really struggle with what they experienced during the war, which leads to, to depression and um, either suicide or attempted suicide which is really you know just so heartbreaking to see after you know they've survived the war only to come home and to have these needs which are unaddressed and not understood um and so while the daughters you know they weren't necessarily the best of friends at the conference they did get along but they didn't walk away from it you know being best friends forever however they do kind of reconvene in interesting ways later in life with this shared experience they've had and understanding each other in ways that no one else can where your private life is so on show for the public uh, and Anna actually reaches out to Sarah at one point to, you know, express this. And it's it's interesting to see how they do support each other in times of challenge and sadness later in life. Yeah, I, I was really um, just thought that was really moving. Um, and especially I think it was Anna Roosevelt, who I didn't know that much about, but her her story is particularly difficult to read what was going on with her husband. Mm -hmm. But with no spoilers, we won't. <laughs> no <laughs> um, exactly. Is there is there such a thing? Do you think as kids being too involved in their parents' politics? I mean, in some way, was this harmful for them? So I'm thinking, you know, moving decades after and looking at Bobby Kennedy and and then looking at Ivanka Trump. I mean, the idea that family is going to be playing some crucial role. It's very controversial. And do you think this was, I mean, were some people critical of these women acting as gatekeepers? And, and could it have been a bad thing for them um, to have that kind of pressure foisted upon them? Uh, because I can imagine that the pressure that, that Anna was under trying to keep people away from her father, it was incredible. And they were all fairly young at the time, right? Yeah. Exactly. Kathy Harriman's 27, uh, Sarah Churchill is 30, Anna Roosevelt's 38. And this is, it's, I think, such an important question to think about today, especially, and would love to get your opinion on this, given your work on the First Ladies and writing about the residents and really that inside look at what it is to be a family living in the White House. I think it's, it's really interesting to consider that role of the adult first children, especially in light of the last couple of years. And we haven't really had to think about that until recently because throughout the, the 90s and early 2000s, the children in the White House were young children, so it wasn't really an issue. First children have been involved in their parents' administrations going all the way back to John Quincy Adams' son, who served as a principal private secretary for him. So it's more of a logistical role than a policy role. Um, there are you know, questions about uh, too much involvement or nepotism, of course, with you know, you know, JFK and Bobby Kennedy. People didn't always love that Eleanor Roosevelt was really involved and really active in the administration. They'd write into the White House saying that Eleanor was not elected. Uh, she has no business other than being there as a private person. And I think you saw that also sometimes with Hillary Clinton during Bill Clinton's administration and her work in healthcare, which is really fascinating. And so these are themes that repeat. In a way, I kind of think of it like, you know, when you marry someone, you marry their family. In a sense, when you elect someone, you elect their family too. Mm -hmm. And we've acknowledged that there should be a defined role for a first spouse. But the role of first children, and especially adult first children, is one that I don't know if we can really draw a bright line rule on what the appropriate level of involvement is. And as you point out, it's not always the best thing for them to be that in the spotlight or to have that kind of responsibility some first children might have great abilities and expertise in a particular area where you'd love to have them involved. 
others maybe not. So I actually would love your opinion on that issue, especially in light of the last you know couple of years. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that I always think that a book about first children would be really interesting to write. But it, I I started writing about politics when President Obama was in office and no, you know, Sasha and Malia Obama were off limits and because they were such young girls. And so I always had the feeling that they should that, that children of presidents should really be um, given a lot of grace and a lot of privacy. And I think everyone in the White House press corps at the time felt that way. But looking at how that changed with the Trumps, if you're inserting yourself in your parents' lives in that way politically, then everything is up for, for grabs. And I was surprised there wasn't more uproar actually about Ivanka and Jared because when Hillary Clinton, as you say, had an office in the West Wing, you know, was at the helm of, of healthcare policy, her approval ratings plummeted, he, he suffered for her involvement. And I was surprised that that there wasn't more um, made of that because I do think I do think that the children should stay out as much as possible. I just think it's it's impossible to give your parents unbridled kind of the, the truth completely i think when you have so many moving parts and um in things like inheritance you know that you're dealing with you don't want to anchor your father too much um and so i i just i i am not a fan of the nepotism that i think people have come to kind of accept in a way um but i also think that you know kids should be able to be involved in the campaign and we know george w bush was very involved in his dad's campaign and would, would ream out reporters who wrote bad stories about his dad and you know i think the campaign is a little different you can use your kids like you would have a spouse out on the front lines campaigning for you um but it's the actual policy making that i think they should stay out of um but because i i think it just always leads it to a bad place and 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 frankly there's no child of a president i can think of who's qualified to to weigh in on these matters really it should be based on your qualifications but i do think what you covered with their these women um giving their fathers real world kind of advice i mean it reminds me a little bit of the johnsons and both of their daughters had husbands serving in vietnam and so they you know lucy and linda bird would tell their father at dinner about what their husbands were experiencing and do you think that these daughters were able to tell their fathers about the actual realities of the war that maybe they wouldn't have seen uh from their vantage yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as I mentioned, Sarah Churchill working with a really broad array of diverse people across Britain in her work in military intelligence, but specifically at Yalta, one of the most important roles that the daughters play for their fathers is that they're able to actually go out into the local community and meet the Soviet people whose lives have been pretty summarily destroyed by the war. And there's some absolutely heartbreaking scenes that they witness where these cities have been completely destroyed. People are living in homes that are missing a wall or missing a roof. You know, the only people they see are very old or very young people because everyone else is off fighting the war. And yet, despite all this tragedy and loss, they see a real sense of hope and spirit in the Soviet people, which is very different than dealing with the Soviet bureaucrats in Stalin's inner circle. And there's actually a lot of similarity between the spirit and resilience of the Soviet people compared to, you know, think of like the, the people in London living through the, the blitz and that, you know, keep calm and carry on mentality, the equivalent of that in the Soviet Union. And Sarah Churchill is especially moved by this. And she comes back and talks to her father late at night about what she's seen and the sense of hope that she has in the future. And so they absolutely are able to give voice to the regular people whose lives are being reordered by the conversations taking place across the negotiating table. And I think also interestingly, they are able to be for their fathers a representation of the future and what it is they're trying to secure and achieve with Yalta and the end of the war. Metaphor metaphorically, of course, they're speaking about we have to secure peace in the future for the sake of our children, uh, kind of you know, the children of the world at large. But for these men, it's also much more immediate and much more personal. It's their own children who are right there in front of them at their side, serving as their partners at this conference that gives them an extra reason to make it right at the end of this war so that they don't go through another period like the transition from World War I to the Depression to then the rise of the Nazis in World War II. They have to get it right this time, specifically because their children are counting on them. Were any of them around to see their grandchildren and what that relationship was like? Because oftentimes the 
grandchildren don't carry the baggage and the weight that the children do. And mm -hmm. it's so much easier to bond with grandchildren and children for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And I'm wondering what that dynamic was like, or if you got if you looked into it at all. I know Roosevelt didn't, right? Because he died so shortly after. Um, he did actually have a, a little bit of some. He did ha have uh, some grandchildren who were old enough. Anna had three children at the time of Yalta. She, she had three children, and her daughter Ellie was actually 18 when Yalta took place. And she has really clear memories of the conference. And I was so fortunate to be able to interview Ellie and get to know her and hear her memories of when her her mother went to Yalta and the stories she came home with, and also Anna's youngest son. Uh, who was only five at the time of Yalta, and he became very ill while Anna was away, and remembers you know, hearing on the news, you know, the, after the conference, you know, just kind of vague things while he was sick in the hospital, and everyone was so worried about him while Anna was gone. Um, but he also uh, kind of played a little bit of a role in the story too, even as a five-year-old, because he would go in and visit his grandfather in the Oval Office, and he'd go in with his dog. And one time he went in to try to play while April Harriman had come all the way from the Soviet Union to brief FDR on what was happening, how we might not have the right approach to dealing with the Soviets, really trying to warn him about what he's seeing on the ground, which is very time sensitive and pressing and urgent. And he's come all this way and he has to wait until little Johnny toddles out back into the garden because he wants to play with his grandfather. So it is really sweet. Um, but also the, you know, the chance to speak with people like Churchill's grandchildren and great grandchildren while researching the book just, I mean, no one knows them like their own family and it makes history not feel so far away. And that was something that was really special about getting to know them, getting to know Kathy Harriman's sons. All three families were absolutely wonderful, really respected the role of the historian needing to be objective, but were so forthcoming with information and detail and also love for their family. And that was really special to see. So I will always be so grateful for that. How did the Roosevelt's, uh, I'm thinking of Anna's daughter, how did she talk about Lucy Mercer and that whole relationship? I mean, how did, are they very protective of Eleanor's legacy so they don't want to focus too much on it? Or do they look at it in a very kind of honest, unvarnished way, uh, talking about their grandfather was not perfect, no one is, and I think that's what makes him really fascinating. Yeah, I, I think when your family is as known and as much has been written about them, you know, it's hard not to be somewhat um, at a distance when you're describing things like that. And especially if you know you were a very young child and you know it's your grandfather, you know, there's there is a bit of a remove and just kind of acceptance of this person as a historical figure. We know everything about them, good and bad. And so there is kind of a, an objective and balanced way that they talk about it. But I think that there's also so much admiration and respect for Eleanor today among so many people that she really has her own legacy almost independent of FDR, of which they're also incredibly proud. And that is wonderful. And I think uh, it was important to Anna also, as she went on in her life, to be the custodian of not just her father's, but also her mother's legacy. Hmm. And how do you think that led to some of their own personal issues later on in life, that they're the children of these highly accomplished people? And I think this goes for Churchill's wife too, because she was a force. Um, she was. You know, right. Um, yeah. And none of these three women rose to that level because who could possibly rise to that level? What kind of pressure did they have on them? And also, I mean, at the time, they, as you say, they couldn't really run for office or get into politics in any real way. It would be very difficult. I think Margaret Chase Smith, though, was already around and there were female politicians. But no matter what they did, they kind of were damned if they did or damned if they didn't, because if they stuck their neck out and tried to get involved, they wouldn't be as successful as their parents. So it's smarter to take a different path in life. And I'm just wondering if you think this is a double edged sword, being a, a, a child of someone as, as successful. I think it is. And also, at the same time, I don't know that they wanted to have that seat at the height of power like their parents. There were definitely aspects, even going back to their early lives, where that enormous role that their fathers had in the world was complicated for family relationships. And there's actually a lot of similarity between Eleanor Roosevelt and Clementine Churchill, both brilliant women, both great advocates and advisors, and... Um, just huge assets to their husbands. Churchill respected Clementine's opinion more than anyone. Uh, and we all know the great work that Eleanor and FDR achieved together. And yet, unfortunately, I think for both of them, 
as much as they did publicly, sometimes it didn't translate as immediately to their children where they both kind of struggled to give their children the love and affection um, that their children really wanted. And Clementine Churchill really explicitly said, I decided early on that I could either be a great partner to Winston or a great mother, and I chose to be a great partner. And so that's, it's interesting, and you can see that kind of the similar patterns reflected in both families. So that's one element where it comes in. But I also think sometimes, you know, we're a little bit quick to uh, give these, kind of write them off as, oh, they they couldn't live up to their parents, kind of not taking into account, maybe they don't want to be their parents, but also every mistake that they make, every challenge that they go through, every heartbreak that they experience is going to be splashed across the front page for all the world to see. And it's just um, really um, hard to see, especially when there were so many tragedies because of the scars of the war that they experienced, that there's not enough understanding, I think, of the loved ones who were impacted by the legacy of the war, especially for these women, um, but so, so many women and so many families across the world. Was there a sense that they were also kind of naive? I think we look at Yalta now as there was a lot of uh, wishful thinking there. For instance, there was the massacre of many, I mean, I forget the number, but it was a famous um, massacre of Polish soldiers. And they, well, the Soviets said the Nazis did it, and it was actually the Soviets that did it. Was there kind of a desperate desire to believe that the Soviets were, you know, on on the Allied side and kind of tunnel vision without taking into account the truth at the time. I think we have a frozen Catherine. We up, yep. Oh, it's a frozen uh, Catherine? Okay, I never know if it's me. Yeah, Please. we have a frozen Catherine and okay. we're waiting for her to be like, this is Jamie okay. from the library. But this, this conversation is just, uh, so fascinating. Uh, Catherine is on her dorm room um, Wi-Fi, and it was really going great there. Whoops. Oh, we've lost her. Maybe she's going to try to come back in. I think Let this book see. is so, um, it's just beautifully written and very well researched. And um, it's, a, it's a topic that I, I, I mean, it's literally something I'd never heard of, that these three women were at Yalta. And I think she's so right that you barely you know, even in AP history, Yalta's kind of graced over. So I think it's just a fascinating book and really engaging. Yes, I've, I've invited Catherine back on screen. So hopefully her connection will be strong enough and she'll be joining us again. And, um, you know, Kate, this has been a wonderful conversation. And um, so um, we do have a question here for you, Kate. I'm wondering what's next for you. Um, Oh, yeah. uh, there's two questions here. One about Catherine's research and what's up next for her. And then also for you, Kate, what's up next for you as well? Um, well, I'm working on a book about Elizabeth Taylor, actually, with her family. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the first time that the family has opened up her diaries and papers mm -hmm. and love letters to her seven husbands. Um, she was married eight times, but uh, twice to the same person, Richard Burton. And I'm talking a lot with... Um, people in the early uh, years of the AIDS pandemic. And she was very fearless and kind of, well, she wasn't fearless, she had a lot of fear, but she was courageous. And so that's what I'm working on. Hi. Sorry. Hi. I, I, uh, you know, I would think Harvard would have great Wi-Fi, but apparently not um, hotspotting. So hopefully that will be fine. <laughs> You're good now. You're yeah. good. One, one check mark in the Princeton category, you know, one mark against Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Princeton has better Wi Fi for sure. Yes. Um, well, I think, I mean, was there anything? So I, I was asking you about, um, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know so much about Yalta, but the, the sort of naive view that the, the Soviets were the, I mean, they didn't think the Soviets were the good guys, but there was obviously, and, I, and you can talk a little bit about the massacre that happened. And I think Kathy was kind of believing the Soviets line. Yeah. So 
so one of the things that Kathy uh, was responsible for while she was her father's uh, really assistant ambassador uh, before Yalta, and one of the reasons that she was the person that Avril Harriman wanted to bring to Yalta um, was that she was asked by her father to serve as a witness to what was called the Ketan Forest Massacre, which was uh, the discovery of mass graves of Polish officers, thousands of Polish officers in the woods on the western edge of the Soviet Union. The Soviets blamed the murder on the Germans, the Germans blamed it on the Soviets, trying to use it as a, a wedge to drive the Soviets away from the uh, Brits and the Americans. And so Avril Harriman needs somebody to go and assess the situation who's one step removed from speaking officially for the American government. So he asked Kathy to go and serve as the witness, uh, also because she'd been a, a war reporter and journalist in London, and he thought that she would have the ability to see it objectively, even amidst all of the tragedy. So Kathy goes and has to be the witness to this and try to make an assessment of who's telling the truth. And unfortunately, she just doesn't have enough evidence to refute the Soviets. And so while she's skeptical about what she's being told, it just can't reach the threshold of, I think, calling them out as liars. And so she can only report what she knows with those reservations. And that report ends up going becoming kind of the official story. And so it's a really complicated position for this young woman who's you know, only 27 years old, she might have been even 26 at the time, to have this responsibility, which is astounding. But I think that the, the story of the Yalta Conference and the rising power of the Soviet Union and the falling power of the British Empire, and the sense that we have that Stalin kind of uh, put one over on the West, and he walked away as the victor and we were the losers in a way, even though we were all supposedly on the same side, really goes to show what a lack of knowledge we had in the West and especially the United States about the Soviet Union at the time. We hadn't had diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union since after the Russian Revolution, before Roosevelt normalizes relations about 20 years later. Avril Harriman was one of very few businessmen who had done business in the Soviet Union in that period. Very few people in the US studied Russian. There was one English to Russian language book. Um, it just was a huge gap of knowledge. We didn't have intelligence capabilities. And there are about a handful, you know, maybe six experts in the Soviet, uh, on the Soviet Union in the State Department. One of them is George Kennan, who is Avril Harriman's number two in Moscow. He, of course, goes on to be a wise man of the Cold War. Uh, Chip Bolin, who uh, was serving as Roosevelt's interpreter at Yalta. But Roosevelt also doesn't have a great grasp of the Soviet Union either. And he's reluctant to rely on the few experts he has because he really wants to rely on his powers of personal persuasion to form this personal bond with Stalin, much like he has with Churchill. And that personal bond will be the thing that carries them through uh, the period where their common enemy has been defeated and they need a, a new reason to have a connection and to bring the Soviet Union into the international community when the war is over. And I think, unfortunately for Roosevelt, he didn't have enough specific knowledge or the um, the insistence to gain that in that specific knowledge about dealing with the Soviets, and that really let us down. And even though there might not have been anything we could have done differently by the time of Yalta, because that would have required opening the second the Western Front a year earlier, which would have meant that we would have has, had to start rearmament much earlier for the Soviets not to have control of Eastern Europe. But I think it just is a kind of a reinforcing pattern of you have to know you know, your adversaries around the world. And sometimes yeah, it's kind of keeping you know, your friends close and your enemies closer. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a, a real lesson learned and one that I think we forget sometimes even in foreign policy today, especially when dealing with Russia, that that connection with Putin isn't going to be a breakthrough in the foreign policy. It's going to come through areas of mutual cooperation where there is mutual benefit to working together, but not from a deep personal friendship and sense of admiration that you might find with another world leader. Mm -hmm. And you think going into Yalta, there was a bit of naivete there that we were going to go and they were going to become friends. Yeah. Or at least. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> yes. I, I think it's a wonderful book and I love the photos. It's interesting because one of the there were not a lot of photos of um, the three women together really to choose from, were there? No, there weren't. And that picture actually has a nice other little intergenerational sort of story. It was taken by the son of Harry Hopkins, Robert Hopkins, yeah. who was the official American photographer at the conference. And uh, Harry Hopkins was a longtime advisor to FDR. He was also extremely sick by the time of Yalta, really drags himself there. He's dying of stomach cancer, which is so tragic. But his son, Robert, is the official photographer, and he takes this picture of the three daughters together after the the official photography from the conference has been concluded that, you know, that 
famous picture of the big three together with their military advisors behind them. And he does you know, have the foresight to take a picture of the little three as well. So their place <laughs> in history is preserved. But one thing I love is that we know that famous picture of the three leaders together. It's often on the cover of World War II books and you know, in our textbooks, but there's another picture of the exact same scene from a slightly different angle. And you can actually see the daughters standing off to the side uh, underneath the, the veranda in the courtyard where the pictures were being taken. And that was one of the greatest gems and you know, little discoveries that I found while doing the research and just, you know, research turns up so many treasures and that was one of them. Um, but oh, before I- the, the personal touches that you put in here about what it was like when they got to Yalta to the palace <laughs> and there, there weren't enough bathrooms for people, yeah, right? No bathrooms. Was, it was like yeah. three bathrooms for delegations of hundreds of people. You've got field marshals and admirals queuing for the toilet in the morning. <laughs> You've got the air, uh, British air marshals through Peter Portal hopping up and down to look through the transom to see who's taking too long in the bath and heckling them to get out. It's just you know, so undignified and <laughs> hilarious. It's just those little details, I think, that you know it makes history feel uh, more relatable to us and to our relationships today. And that's something that I wanted to highlight, both in you know the conditions around the conference, the relationships with the fathers and daughters. But one thing that I, I wanted to note about the cover that I don't want to forget um, so the picture of the three of them on the front, if you look at it, is actually a little bit different from the picture that Robert Hopkins took that is in the, the yeah. uh, middle of the book. Mm -hmm. And so we had initially put the picture of the three daughters on the front. And then what, what had happened was we when we colorized it, the mm -hmm. way that Anna Roosevelt was holding her gloves and purse looked like she was holding a cat when it was colorized. Oh. And so we, <laughs> it was very strange. So we ended up switching the position of Kathy and Anna. So Kathy's in the middle and Anna's on the end. And that little change oh. just kind of drew your eye away. So it didn't look like she was holding a cat. <laughs> Oh yeah, and you actually got rid of the little white uh, the the gloves that she's yeah. holding. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> okay. that's so funny. It's funny how these things come together. Yeah, isn't things it? that you you don't think are going to be a problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always amazing. What are what are you working on now? Are you? I mean, you're going to school full time, but um, are you thinking of any other books right now? I am. Yes. So I am in law school. Um, I have another year and a half still of law school, and I'm actually really excited that I'll be in Washington, D.C. this spring um, and summer. Uh, I'll be working uh, in part of a program that we have at Harvard Law where you can uh, work as a lawyer in government for the semester. So I'm excited to do that, um, which will be a lot of fun. We'll have, a to little come experience. we'll have to I'm go out for to lunch. That would be lovely <laughs> i can't wait um i'm so excited to be there and to see a little bit of kind of how the history that i write about actually unfolds in the present as everybody's uh, working on it which is you know, will be really exciting but i uh, am attempting to work on another book but have been thwarted in the progress i wanted to make at this point because the archive with the documents that i need to access is still mostly closed because of covid so i can't actually get any of the material i need to write the book so i'm hoping by january access will be a little bit better i don't know if you've encountered that in your your work I know a number of historians are now a year or two years delayed on their next books because they can't get documents either. Uh, so it's just one of the, the little ways that COVID is still a challenge. And um, of course, if health and safety. Were, but <laughs> if things weren't digitized ahead of time, I, I hope that this makes um, an impact for archivists to know that just as soon as they get back to the office, digitize mm -hmm. everything you possibly yes. can. Because it's amazing what you can get online mm -hmm. through certain libraries. I mean, like the JFK Library, I mean, incredible mm -hmm. information, but a lot of libraries still are behind on digitizing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And when you think of the millions of documents that are in these archives, especially something like the National Archives, I think we're still yeah. a ways away from that. But a hopefully, lot. fingers crossed, we'll be able to get back in soon. Well, it was wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Well, thank yes, you I'm so sitting much. here nodding in agreement about the getting <laughs> things digitized. We're working yeah. on that um, at our library with even like local things. You'd be surprised um, the local level, how many, you know, we have a whole arc. We have at the library, the only copies of some paper, newspapers that go back that tell the story of important Princetonians. And so we've been working to do our own archive of the newspapers of Princeton. I think we're getting pretty close, right, Becky? Becky I know Becky's on here. Oh, good. But yeah, um, we get a number of calls to the our reference desk, you know, of us having to go and then look and get out the things and photocopy and send them off. And so getting these things online is is really crucial to a lot of people for different reasons. And um, But thank you so much, both of you, for this fascinating conversation. And um, Catherine, while you were um, disconnected we did hear from kate about her upcoming project about elizabeth taylor and i'm going to look forward to that uh, it's a little different but it's very i mean that's the fun of it i get to write about uh you know the crop diamond which is 
you know, an eight million dollars. And I heard the story about Elizabeth Taylor, and she was married to like a politician, and then she went to this like small town somewhere yeah. and choked on a chicken bone or something. Yes, a stone <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> I <got her. laughs> that's one of the reasons why I got into the book is because I was interviewing John Warner, and that was the senator that he was she was married oh. to. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was just telling her that I'm working on a book about Elizabeth Taylor with her family and um, the trustees of her estate. And I started writing it a couple of years ago when John Warner was, uh, unfortunately, he's, he's passed, but he was so generous with his time. And it was amazing to hear about her living in this farm in Virginia and right. hating her life because she didn't <laughs> have anything to do. Um, oh. But it's it's a departure. But I just think telling the stories of these women's lives, regardless of you know politicians or actors or you know humanitarians, and she was also a humanitarian, it's really important. There are not enough books about women's contribution um, to history, and uh, and I think they're often kind of. I think people think of Elizabeth Taylor as this like sex symbol, but really she was a lot more than that. You know, um, so it's important. Absolutely multi-dimensional with much more depth than she's giving credit for. Well, I yeah. want to hear all about this in as much detail as you're willing to share over lunch in DC. Okay, <laughs> okay. let's do it. <laughs> Thank you both. This has been a wonderful evening. We have lots of accolades coming in from those people, from everybody online. And your conversation was so fascinating and covered so much. I don't think there was questions to come in because you guys really just covered it all. And I don't think anybody wanted to stop the, the, the great conversation that was happening. <laughs> Um, you guys have a good chemistry together, so you guys should consider doing this tour together more often. Talking about great women <laughs> history that you've covered. That'd be great fun. <laughs> well, thank you okay. so much, Janie, for having me. And thank, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you, Kate, for doing this conversation with me. And thank and, you and all please, for um, listening. <laughs> both of you know that you always have an invite to come, either in person or virtually, to Princeton Public Library. Thank we would love you. to have you. Uh, we are returning to, we're starting to do what's hi called hybrid programming, where we're having very small, controlled audiences in person and then streaming them online. We will be starting that at the end of the month as a move back towards more in person. So, fingers you know, crossed. fingers yeah. crossed that it all works out. Uh, Becky yeah. here's online is helping us get all that, that technology going so that we can go hybrid and then hopefully return oh. soon to in person. We miss that as authors so much. Yeah. Actually, Absolutely. Talking to readers in person makes a big difference. So hopefully it's we can both difference. come up there in person. Yeah, that would be so okay. great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank and good you night so to everybody. Much. Good night. So thank you for attending. Okay. Good night.